live from the mist and shrouded mountaintop fortress that is X and Y Communications Headquarters. You're listening to the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. And now, here's your host, Scott McKay. How's it going, gentlemen? Welcome to yet again another episode of the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. My name is Scott McKay. You can find me on just about any social media platform nowadays by searching my name, S-C-O-T-M-C-K-A-Y. We have a thriving Facebook group, gentlemen, called the Mountaintop Summit. If you have not joined up with that group of men yet, hey, join us. Give it a shot. I think you'll enjoy what you find there. A lot of guys uh, who are getting better with women and having a good time doing it. And uh, a lot of the guys are making friends with each other and following each other elsewhere. And uh, it's really just a good vibe. Hope you'll join us at the Mountaintop Summit. Also, the website, as always, is mountaintoppodcast.com. That has been recently upgraded, and you can now download all kinds of books and reports for free. Get on my newsletter, which is daily and fluff free, also for free. And all that's there for you and much more at mountaintoppodcast.com. Today, I have a guest joining me, and I have to say, it's probably overdue to get him on this show. My wife, Emily, and I were guests on his podcast several years ago, and now he has come up with a fantastic book built on an equally fantastic premise that's called Follow Your Yes. His name is Ken Bechtel, and he joins us from uh, sunny Colorado. Ken, welcome, man. Scott, it's great to be here. It's been a while. Yeah, man, it's been a while since we talked, and you're a good dude, and I don't know why that hasn't happened. <laughs> but we're certainly going to rectify that situation yeah. right here, right now, talking about what is actually your favorite subject nowadays, which is following your yes. And as you and I were visiting about your book, we were kind of putting our heads together trying to figure out what topic we would actually bring to the table for these guys on this very show, and it kind of just hit both of us that we should just talk about following your yes and see where that subject goes, because it's not something we've really talked about ever on this show before. So the first question has got to be, Ken, what inspired you to write such a book? Yeah, that's a good question, Scott, because for years and years and years, people would ask me to write a book and I'm like, I'm not a writer. I don't have any interest in writing a book. That's not a goal of mine. And as it turned out, I had, you know, all this different information and materials and work I've been doing for years. And I realized the theme was this idea of following your yes. And as you know, from when you and Emily were on my show, there was a segment of my show called follow your yes. And that was five, six years ago. And I totally forgot that that's what I called it. And then I knew I had a new yes in my life, which was, oh, I, I actually, I do want to write a book for some reason. I'm called to do that now. And so I started delving into it. And of course, the topic of follow your yes was the no brainer. Well, I was going to say, it seems like you said no to writing the book for quite some time before finally finding and following your yes about it. Exactly right. Yeah. Right. And, and <laughs> okay. it's, it's, I know it seems a little ironical, but what's interesting about that is, you know, your yes is about what's your yes right now. It's not your yes forever. So I may write another book. I may never write another book. Maybe this is the only time that writing a book is a yes. And when we can stay in that fluidity, we don't get stuck in these ruts of, oh, this is the one thing I said yes to, and now I'm stuck with it forever and ever. You know, it's funny how we as men can hear sharp, smart people say really cool things and really resonate with it. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, you know what? That's incredibly important. Just a few weeks ago, we had Frank Miniter on the show who works for the NRA and he's all about freedom and he knows the constitution inside and out. And he said, man, if you're going to be an American and you're going to live by American values and you're going to be a man, you got to be an individual. You can't just follow the herd and fall into this sleepwalk, as it were, of just doing what you're told because the government said so. And interestingly enough, just a couple of days after I was listening to my friend, Michael Barry, who has a nationally syndicated talk show, mostly in the Southeast. It was on the occasion of George C. Scott's birthday, had he mm -hmm. still been alive. And he played in its entirety that infamous first scene from the Patton movie. Yeah. Where he famously talks to his troops about manning up. And I had to chuckle because one of the main points that 
George C. Scott's patent drove into the ground was, we don't have any individualists in this army. If you're going to be a patriot and you're going to be a winner, we act like a team here in the United States. Nobody's an individual. And I had to laugh because that's the exact opposite thing Minotaur said. Mm -hmm. But in context, both of them sound amazing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly. So what you just said is, hey, you know what? Your yes may change. It may move on to something else. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, you don't want to get stuck in a rut. You kind of always want to check in with yourself and make sure you're headed in the right direction. And we all evolve. And that may mean things change. But, you know, here on this show, we've talked time and again about finding your life purpose. And so many guys just lack direction. And you need to find what's important to you and stick to it and build your lifestyle around it. And then, you know, here you come along kind of saying, hey, you know what? Maybe there's some middle ground there. Or there's a little bit of a difference between that and being a man of purpose or having long-term goals or ambition. How would you reconcile those two very manly ideas, the one that I just mentioned and the one that you just talked about? Yeah, I, I'm so glad you brought this up, Scott, because this is actually a, a stumbling point for a lot of people, but it's either one or the other. And the truth is, your yes, as I talk about it, fits within whatever your purpose is. So you have a purpose of whatever it may be, to build a company, to be a good parent, whatever it happens to be. Well, within that, on a day-to-day -day basis, on an hour-to-hour, minute-to-minute basis, what is the thing that most allows you to be the best you can be within that context? So that's your yes, like, oh, I need to take some time for myself. Oh, I need to go contribute to my community. Whatever these things are that show up, they're within the greater umbrella of the purpose, what drives you, how you're contributing to your community. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I really like what you're saying, Ken, because I think way too many of us, especially post COVID have lulled ourselves into the sleepwalk of believing things have to be all or nothing. Yeah. I have to believe everything the party I voted for says and nothing of what the other people said. Uh, it's almost like a dogmatic religious argument on everything. I mean, it used to be dudes fought over Fords and Chevys. <laughs> now we're fighting over, you know, whether you're a terrorist or not. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And it seems like the whole concept, frankly, of, you know, I can have things I'm doing and making decisions about on the daily relative to living my life purpose. You know, such a thought seems very far away for a lot of guys. And I think perhaps, and I'm wondering if you'll, You'll agree with this or have anything to add to it. Maybe the first step should be realizing our entire life is in a series of black and white arguments and associated decisions. There's some middle ground and some gray area on just about everything, isn't there? A hundred percent. And I mean, your, your comment about arguing about Fords and Chevys. Well, yeah, you have your preferred brand, right? But the truth, the umbrella there is you're all passionate about cars. Okay, so that's our, we're not either or like, oh, no, if you don't like Chevys, you don't like cars. Nobody's saying that. They're just saying, oh, this is your flavor within that that passion. And the same thing goes in our life of going, yeah, you may do that differently. Music's another great example, right? Oh, I love music, but you could like country and I like classical and somebody else likes jazz. Well, then we still all like music. It's not if you don't like jazz, you don't like music. Hey, that's your own distinct flavor. That's cool. And when it comes to, you know, in relationships, you think about that. Well, that's what makes you interesting. Your unique expression as opposed to, well, it's just the same as everybody else. I'm, I'm, I'm a guy and I'm in this field and, and everybody listens to hard rock. So I got to be into hard rock. Yeah. You know, I'm thinking as you talk, there's some mofo out there who's a Mopar guy going, yeah, well, both of you are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. We skipped Mopar. Sorry, guys. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you were talking about music. It's interesting. I used to be so anti certain kinds of music that to me represented certain types of culture. Yeah. And I only gravitated towards music that fit my own weirdo stereotype back when I was a kid. And the older I get, the more eclectic my iPod gets. Yeah. It's just amazing and wonderful, I think. So this whole idea of expanding one's horizons leads us to being a more well-rounded person, a smarter more knowledgeable person with a lot more wisdom 
And it all starts when we say yes to something that perhaps we're used to saying no to, whether that's music or buying a different kind of car for a change. I mean, let's just say Tesla probably threw a wrench in everybody's works when it comes to Merck and cars, right? Yeah. <laughs> Unless, of course, you're against EVs, which is probably another all or nothing argument. But what you're talking about here, I think, is important for a lot of guys even to wrap their heads around at the baseline level, because so many of us, especially as men, young or old, frankly, Ken, are set in our ways. We get yeah. our system in place. We get our setup going. And like I've talked about in the past, we as men can sit on that status quo for decades without any real need to change, can't we? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we can get pretty entrenched. And part of that is our internal, like our natural wiring is to be efficient and get a good return on whatever energy we expend. And so if we already know, hey, there, here's a system, it works, I'm not going to get any flack, I won't ever have to defend it, my community's all on board, why would I change? Yeah, right. A lot of times also men in our masculine nature think, okay, I've got this handled, I don't want to create any drama, I don't want to enter anything into the scenario that's going to cause stress, anything that would cause my family, my kids to feel lack of safety and security, as long as I have this under control and handled, then I am performing my masculine duty as a man. But that can get boring too, right? I mean, a couple of years ago, I did an entire group coaching session called Unsettled because too many men just get set in our ways and we could let ourselves die here instead of living to our fullest. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And we actually have a tendency to do that. Right. We we yes. will literally go so far in one direction, we will bankrupt ourselves in other parts of our life. And one of the things that is true for everyone, men and women, but especially for men, again, because we want to be efficient, we oftentimes think that when things are off for us, that it's obvious. So if it's obvious, well, I don't need to say it because it's obvious and that would be a waste of time and energy. So then we get frustrated because others aren't understanding where we are when we think it's just, you know, big neon sign, super obvious. And the truth is, other people don't know. Ken, can you give me an objective example of what you're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. Let's say you're in a relationship, whether you're married or whatever, it could be just dating. And you need time for yourself to kind of recharge and unwind. But your partner is wanting to be together all the time. They got to have all this. Oh, my gosh, I need to be around you. I love all the time we spend together. And, you know, you like that too, but you also need some personal time. Now, you're thinking she should pick up on this, that this is obvious. Like, every guy needs this. Everybody knows this. And so you don't say anything. And because you don't want to rock the boat, you go along and you spend the time with her. And the whole time you're like, geez, would she go home? Or whatever it happens to be so you can have that downtime for yourself. Because men need that downtime to recharge. Well, because it's obvious to us as men... We think it's obvious to everybody, not realizing that they recharge from that interaction and connection with us. So they would never think that being alone is a good thing. They think that's like the worst thing. So we have to own that. In this case, that yes is, hey, I actually let's do our own thing this weekend or tonight or wherever it happens to be and letting them know what that provides for you, which is usually the missing piece in all our communication is if we don't let them know what it provides, well, if it doesn't provide the same for them, they might think it's really ridiculous. Like, what do you need that for? If you're saying, hey, I'd really need to recharge. I had a rough week. I just need some time to myself. Well, now they know what it provides. And if they're actually, you know, really on your side, they're going to be like, oh, of course, I want you to be able to recharge and be your best. So what's that look like? And then you can figure out what that looks like. But if you just assume they're going to know and think it's obvious because it's obvious to you, we usually find that that's not true. And, and the thing I want you to understand, guys, is we're worried about stating the obvious, but the only outcomes from stating the obvious are both positive. One, you state something that you think is obvious. The other person goes, oh, I had no idea. I'm so glad you told me. So now you've just clarified something that they didn't know. Or two, you state what you think is obvious. And they go, oh, yeah, I already knew that. And now you just confirmed that you're on the same page. So either way, it's a win-win. So there's nothing to be afraid of in that. But our wiring as men is that's a waste of time and energy. You know, as you're talking, I'm thinking this might not be gender specific. 
you know, because I'm running through all the file cards of my mind, recalling those times where I asked the woman what's wrong, and she went, nothing, because I was supposed to pick up on it. It was supposed to be obvious. I'm the man. I'm supposed to provide and protect. I'm supposed to read her mind, pick up on all these little emotional clues, all these nonverbal clues, and get this done. And I think this is pretty much a human deficiency in terms of social skill and relating to each other that almost everybody suffers from, at least from time to time. Absolutely. And I 100% agree. It is totally a human skill uh, attribute. And the thing to remember is it happens for different reasons. So for the masculine, we're thinking that'd be a waste of everybody's time and energy. I don't need to state it. It's obvious. For the feminine, they're concerned that stating something that they think is obvious will cause some kind of disruption and therefore cause a, a severing of connection. And connection is vitally important to the feminine. So there you go. I think you're onto something there for sure. Getting back to specifically following one's yes, this last five minutes of conversation has kind of turned us towards the notion that this has quite a bit to do with honesty, doesn't it? Sometimes we should be saying yes to things and we know it, but well, then we know it and owe it, <laughs> you know, instead of cognitively realizing it, we say no to it. And that can also happen in the opposite direction, right? We can say no to things we should have said yes to because we're lazy or because we're scared. And that can pretty much become a tangled web we might weave for ourselves, can't it? Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, the thing about that, Scott, is it is like a tangle. I mean, a web is a perfect example, right? We get stuck in it and we don't even realize we're like, how did I get here? But the more that we can pay attention to, you know, well, my yes doesn't have to be your yes. And that's one of the challenges. Oftentimes we, we have a hard time owning what our yes is because maybe it's not what everybody you hang out with is and you don't have to defend it. But you don't really need to defend it. It's just your yes. The truth of the matter is when you're doing what's true to you, there's always going to be somebody who doesn't like it. Nothing in the world has ever been universally appreciated. There's always somebody that's like, oh, that's terrible. Now, they could be a very fringe element or they could be your best friend. But the truth is, if we're waiting for something that is totally acceptable to everyone, we'll be waiting forever. I think that's a solid point. And what I'm realizing with the style in which you answered that last question is that this idea of trusting our gut, following one's yes and letting one's no be no, I guess, by proxy, is along the same lines as being an independent thinker, only it's about your gut feelings. So if we can somehow combine the best of both worlds, being an independent thinker and following our guts when we know we should trust it, then we're on the way to making way better decisions, aren't we? Yeah. And actually, I would tweak that a little bit, Scott, because it's not about necessarily being an independent thinker. It's about being an independent feeler. Well, that's what I was saying is it goes along the same lines of being an independent thinker, only it's the feeling version. Correct. So these combine into a more holistic viewpoint of thinking and feeling one's way into wisdom. Correct. And a key component of that, especially for men, is, you know, emotions aren't part of a man. We're not supposed to have emotions. We're supposed to be rock solid, stoic men. And emotions don't play in that role. And so we, we sit there and, and can dismiss that emotional part, which is the feeling part, that is actually our guidance system. That's saying well, there's a reason you're drawn to this, because all of our our actions in life, we do them because we believe we will feel better as a result of whatever we're thinking of doing, whether it's eating a certain food, talking to a certain person, taking a certain uh, course in our business, whatever that is, we're motivated by feeling. And so one of the things that we have to recognize is that feeling is actually what starts the engine with the what is it and why is this important? And then you go into your head to tune into, well, how do I execute on this? How do I make this happen? And then the third component is going to your gut, which literally is that courage to take the action, not just know what it is, but actually execute. So it's a three-part components there. And unfortunately, we, we've been kind of trained that it, it's either, well, you're either this really intellectual person or you're this really feeling person. But they're meant to go together. They're meant to work in harmony, all three of those components, your gut, your uh, head, and your heart. Yeah, I agree with you. I think there's a lot of big talk nowadays about being this stoic man, and it's anti-masculine to be all touchy-feely and have emotions. That's for chicks. 
Yeah, well, if you're a Baltimore Ravens fan like I am, Ken, <laughs> and I don't expect that you are in Colorado. No. I challenge you to be all tough and stoic the next time the Ravens blow a fourth quarter like they've been doing this year. Yeah. You just <laughs> I challenge you. You just sit there and be cool when they blow three touchdown leads. I mean, you know, let's get down to brass tacks here. Men are indeed emotional. We fall in love with women. We love our team. We celebrate when they win and throw beer cans at the TV when they lose. You know, Ken, I don't even know where this movement to turn ourselves into Vulcans and robots even comes from. I mean, what good is it for men to be devoid of emotion at all? Now, misplaced emotion, throwing temper tantrums, being an immature little brat, not having a whole lot of willpower, being weak when it comes to any of these childish outbursts, right? I completely get that. I understand why it would be anti-masculine to be like that. But once again, it comes full circle, Ken, to this discussion of it seems like it's all or nothing nowadays. There's no gray area. There's no good emotion that a man can feel. What about passion for your country? What about George Patton up there passionately addressing his troops? There's some emotion there. And no one's going to be calling George Patton a pussy anytime soon. So this holistic mindset you're talking about, I think, is very central to this conversation. Not only is it okay, but it may differ from one man to the next. I love what you said relative to the idea of peer pressure a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. We follow the herd. Our friends are doing this. Everybody's buying one of these. Everybody's going there. Everybody's doing this. And so we feel like we have to, or we're not going to be part of something bigger anymore. And that then becomes a dogmatic response that we never even chose. We're just doing what we're told, which is indeed anti-masculine. So my next question for you is, how do we sort this all out so we know we're even being anything close to authentic? First thing that comes to mind, Ken, is I would think certain Myers-Briggs personality types, et cetera, et cetera are more thinkers than feelers. I mean, we've had guests on this show who say, oh, that is fictional, and you can decide who the hell you're going to be at any at any given moment and change it if you want, which I would, I would imagine you would resonate with. But certain types of people are going to gravitate towards different states of being and different mindsets than other people would. I mean, how do we reconcile all that? Well, and that's a really good question, Scott, because what's funny about it is what I'm hearing in that question, Scott, is that what you're talking about is how do we reconcile this so we can all be the same again? Because that's not the point. Masculinity does not have just one expression. Being a man does not have one expression. Unfortunately, like you were referencing earlier, there's this idea of, you know, you're either black or white, you're in or out. It's this dichotomous view of the world. And when we're looking at that, then, well, if that's where we survive, because if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the top of the pyramid is to belong. I have to belong into some community, into some uh, place that is my brotherhood, let's call it. Well, that's going to keep watering down to the lowest common denominator as opposed to going, oh, here's another expression of that. Here's an expression of that. No, we all have to be the same, which is funny when you were talking about the, the guy from the NRA and he's talking about individuals, but all come join be individuals under the banner of the NRA. Well, in all fairness to Frank, uh, he wasn't talking about gun rights or even 2A when he was talking about that. He was talking more about that masculine yearning to be an individual and therefore we're better providers and protectors in general, writ large, at a primal level. It was more about how to attract women than uh, kind of being a sheeple and expecting women to think that's really sexy and attractive. That's where he was coming from. Got but it. Where I was coming from in terms of the question I just asked you is certainly some people make decisions from a thinking perspective. Some people are more likely to make decisions from a feeling perspective. I guess what we're trying to reconcile in terms of the vernacular I was using mm -hmm. is our own personality type relative to the expectations people are bringing to the table relative to my own rights and privileges to set my own expectations. You know, I think that. We've already kind of covered the fact that, you know, if you're just being a sheeple and following the herd, then, you know, you probably ought to be a little bit more independent minded and follow your own. Yes. 
which may also involve following your own thought process. You obviously want to think this through before you jump off the ledge. So I guess if we're not very familiar with who we are, our identity, our personality, then it becomes a lot more difficult to say yes effectively, doesn't it? So maybe we should go all the way back to the beginning there. Yeah. And part of it is, you know, identifying where did your identity come from? Is it yours or is it what was placed upon you or required of you? And when we start to look at this and go, oh, actually, that's just, you know, whatever I adopted. One of the classics is, you know, a lot of times people's religion is, well, my family was Catholic or my family was Methodist or my family is Baptist. And no thought has been put into it of your own. Like, does this really work for me? That happens all the time in my coaching sessions. All the time. Yeah, for real. You hit the nail on the head. So that's one of the key components, is, as you well know, is where did who we think we are come from? Is it really our choice? Are we choosing? And that's what really your yes is about, is what's the thing that aligns with you at your core? Not because it was universally accepted or that's what they did in your part of the world or whatever that is. And not to be like, oh, I have to challenge everything because some of those things will resonate instantly. You're like, yeah, that's me. That's me. That works. That's great. That's great. This one never really sat with me, but I took it on because that's what my family did. Or that's what I, I mean, a, a simple and everyday example would be sports teams. Oh, you're from Illinois. You must be a Bears fan. Oh, you're from Colorado. You must be a Denver fan. Oh, you're from DC. You must be a, a, a Baltimore fan. Why? And yet, those assumptions are made. And then sometimes we just go, yeah, yeah, I guess I am. Well, it's a somewhat safe assumption for conversational purposes. Do we actually own, again, what we were talking about earlier, do we own if that's true for us or not? Or do we just go, oh, yeah, 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 I guess I am. Because one of the things is if you're guessing that's who you are, chances are that's not you. You know who you are deep down if you ever look. Just like if you really get challenged on something, you will feel that boil up of this really matters to me. There's not a, yeah, I guess I care about whatever it happens to be, gun rights, abortion rights, you know, whatever it is. Or it's like, no, I have a really strong, this is important. And it doesn't have to be important. It could be something you're like, yeah, I know it's a big issue, but it's not really something that I'm that engaged in. It's not that important for me. I do think there are a lot of people who spend a lot of time on social media and hear a narrative so often that they start fooling themselves legitimately into thinking it should be more important to them than it actually is. I think that happens. Absolutely. I think it happens with fewer people than we think. I mean, anybody who's really embroiled in Twitter thinks the whole world is on Twitter and they really aren't, you know, and, Mm -hmm. and they tend to find that out come election time. But I'm fascinated by the idea of, building our identity around that which we uniquely have thought of and felt into relative to doing the things that we think we ought to do because someone told us we should. Sometimes there's a hard decision to be made. Like if I grew up Catholic and my parents are died in the world Catholics and my entire family is Catholic, then deciding that I don't believe that I'm Catholic anymore will have ramifications above and beyond simply what I believe and being true to my belief system. So along with that decision of not really being Catholic anymore might come, well, do I sort of stay closeted about that? (laughs) You know, do I not tell my dear grandmother that I have now apostatized from the Catholic church? That sort of thing gets complicated, but either your yes has to be that I'm going to kind of go through the motions when I'm around my family because I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, or I'm going to own publicly who I am, what I'm about, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there are a lot of situations where that sort of thing comes into play. You know, I think of when people are not heterosexual and they're LGBTQIA, and they know a lot of people are going to have make life very difficult for them, even within their family unit. If they come out of the closet, it's a brave thing to do to live one's truth and let that be a yes from now on. So sometimes this gets complicated, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And it's funny you use the Catholic example, because that actually is my experience. I I grew up in a Catholic family. I used to joke my mom, if they would let women be priests, she would have been the pope. And I mean, I was an altar boy for eight years, the whole thing. That was my world growing up. And I became an adult and went out on my own and was like, this is totally not, it does nothing for me. I'm just going through motions here. 
And I had to make that choice and have that conversation with the family who's Catholic. And and the thing is, it's what you're referencing of worrying about the outcome, how are they going to respond, is what I call preemptive healing. Hmm. We're afraid they won't be able to handle who we are in whatever way that is. And so we deny ourselves. Isn't that oh, well, I can't tell anybody because they won't be able to handle it. Well, here's the problem with that. You're now deciding what they can handle. Talk about arrogance. You're now deciding, oh, well, they won't be able to handle it. What if this is actually the growth opportunity their life has been leading them to, but we took it away from them? And then we lost because we didn't get to be ourselves, and they lost because this opportunity didn't get presented. And I'll give you a perfect example. I had a uh, a client of mine who, she was in her mid-40s. She had this really long, straight blonde hair. It went down to her waist. And and one day I asked her something about it because, you know, it's a pretty unusual hairstyle, especially as an adult. And she goes, well, when I was a little girl, I had this long blonde hair. My mom would brush it every day. And everywhere we went, people would compliment her on how beautiful my hair was. And she would just beam. And I've wanted to cut it since I was, you know, got out of the house when I was at after high school. But I was always afraid it would kill her. Like, I didn't think she would be able to live with that because she was so proud of my hair. So for 20 plus years, she had not changed her hairstyle simply because she was worried about her mom's response. So we've been working together for a while. One day she goes, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to get my hair cut. So she goes to her stylist and, and the stylist is ecstatic because she's been wanting her to change her hair forever. And she cuts her hair and the woman loves it. She's like, oh my God, I'm so glad I did this. I just love it. And she's telling me the story and she goes, and you know, within five minutes, I was terrified because now I was going to have to show up and see my mom with short hair. And so she literally hid. She goes, I didn't go see my parents. They were all in the same city. They used to get together all the time. She goes, but one day it was my mom's birthday. And there was no way I couldn't not show up. So I suck it up and go over there. And she goes, I was so nervous. I walked up to the house I grew up in and I knocked on the door because I was terrified of going in. And my mom answered. And my mom comes to the door and she's like, oh, you cut your hair. And then she just stared at her. And this woman said, I was so sure she was just, her heart was breaking. And then after a moment, her mom goes, I'm so happy. I've been wondering how you'd want to wear your hair. It looks fabulous. How about that? You know, those storylines only prove that this is a lot easier said than done for a lot of people. There's real emotion. Yes. around finally being true to oneself, which is what this is all about. Last question before we close. Ken, what do many men in particular fail to say yes to that they should? And what do they say no to that they shouldn't? Yeah, great question. And I'm going to start with the no part first. So what they often say no to that they shouldn't is being who they are individually. Like we're worried about the group. We're worried about the team. And that doesn't mean you go off and you undermine whatever that community is in your life, but there's room for you within it. There's a great quote from Steve Martin, the comedian. He said, bring your uniqueness to the table. There's room for it. And he was talking to actors and comedians about, you know, people think they, they're out there too far and nobody will be acceptable. He's like, there's room for every expression. On the other side of what men say yes to is feeling like there's not room for them to trust what does work for them? So let's talk in a relationship. Oftentimes, we as men don't trust what we are looking for, what we need. It could be physically, it could be, you know, time, it could be space, it could be all those different aspects of how we're interacting with our partner. And if we're continually feeling like we have to, you know, comply with our partner's framework of what works best or else they'll get upset or they won't like us, we're doing the preemptive thing where we're not allowing them to have the experience of being with who we really are. So owning what we need, what we desire, what we're looking for, what's important to us, those are all components of being able to have that deeper connection that everyone, men and women, desire with the partners and the people that are meaningful in their life. On a more visceral level, what I would add to all the wonderful things you just suggested would be that I think far too many men lack discipline and it's killing us literally. We've done shows about this in the past, but I think I would uh, be remiss if I didn't bring it up here. We're drinking too much. We're eating too much. We're not taking care of ourselves enough. Men are infamous for not going to the doctor. This should be a yes that we're saying no to out of pure convenience. 
and it's not the way a man should act. Uh, you know, I'm showing my true colors here as a guy whose show is sponsored by Jocko Willink's company. Because <laughs> Jocko would tell you motivation is worthless and it's all discipline. Mm-hmm. I personally think it's a lot of fun to be motivated. And the things I'm most excited about doing are the things that I'm motivated to do, not simply acting out of discipline towards. But I do see the point and I do see why a guy who's a former SEAL team leader would make that point. It's kind of his job to be that guy. but. We should be saying yes to that which motivates us that's going to bring something good to the world if we're simply being too chicken to do it, okay? We should say no to the things that hurt us, hurt our family, and we know it, and man up and have the discipline to say no to those things. That's the dimension I would add to what you're saying. But I love I love what you talked about because it was so in tune with the rest of the discussion that you brought from your perspective, which I think is great. And with that, I want to send you guys to Ken Bechtel's book called Follow Your Yes. You can go to mountaintoppodcast.com front slash Amazon and find it at the top of my Amazon influencer queue, since he is our most recent guest. If you're listening to this show later, you know, just search through it until you find the book Follow Your Yes. It'll be there for you. Or you can simply bypass all of those complications and go to mountaintoppodcast.com front slash yes. Why yes? Just say yes and get yourself a copy of Ken Bechtel's excellent book. Ken Bechtel from Colorado, who I'm no longer going to presume is a Broncos fan. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciated this eye-opening conversation. It was great. Thanks, Scott. It was great being here. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. And gentlemen, if you haven't been to mountaintoppodcast.com of late, go there. Download all the free goodies that I talked about at the front end of this show. Hey, check into what's going on with the master classes. We've done seven or eight of them now, gentlemen. All of them have been well attended. Great feedback on all. We're covering topics that are central to life as a man and not leaving anything on the table. So go to mountaintoppodcast.com, click on the master class link. You'll also find a banner for master classes at the foot of just about every post for each particular show as well. And of course, if you haven't gotten on my calendar and talked to me ever before, there's no better time than the present to do that. I'm exactly who you think I'm going to be. 25 minutes is free for all of you guys. Sign up at mountaintoppodcast.com using the red button in the upper right-hand corner. And until I talk to you again real soon, this is Scott McKay from X and Y Communications in San Antonio, Texas. Be good out there. The Mountaintop Podcast is produced by X and Y Communications. All rights reserved worldwide. Be sure to visit www.mountaintoppodcast.com for show notes. And while you're there, sign up for the free X and Y Communications newsletter for men. This is Ed Roy Odom speaking for the Mountaintop Podcast.